Good morning. It's wonderful to see you here with us. It's great to have folks online joining us in worship. We're delighted you're here, whether you're here every week or whether it's your first time or second time. Uh, we just are so blessed to be able to get together and worship, and we're glad you decided to be a part of that with us. We have, uh, we'd like to stay in touch with you, know more about you, and the way we do that is through the Connect card, which is actually a card. Uh, and you can get one in the back if you want one, or if you're one of those, got one of those fancy Google machines, you can uh, scan the uh, QR code that's on the screen or on the door back there and do the same thing. What we use this for is simply to share information. We want to know about you, know that you were here. If you have a need in your life, something you'd like to share with the church, with our staff, uh, this is the place to do it, whether it's a prayer request or change of information. You can also sign up for Nick's Notes, uh, Nick Skinner, our Senior minister sends out a, a notes every Friday, Thursday or Friday, sometimes Thursday, yeah, sometimes he's early, but uh, information about what's going on in church. So if you want to be a part of that, just fill it out through the Connect card. We're delighted that you're here. If you want to contact our staff, you can do that. You can go to our website, nschristianchurch.org, or you can email office at nschristianchurch.org or any one of the names of our staff members at nschristianchurch.org. So we'd love to connect with you and uh, know more about what's going on. We're delighted again that you're here. If you'll stand with me, we'll begin our worship with prayer, and then we'll sing praises. God, we're so thankful that we can come together like this. We're thankful that we have the freedom and the opportunity to gather together and to uh, worship you, to lift your name up, to sing your praises, to hear your truth declared. And we just pray that by being here, uh, we become better equipped, more able to serve you and honor you when we leave here, that uh, we're built up, that we, are, that we learn more about you, we learn more about what you have called us to, both as a church and individually. And we just give you praise for everything that happens here, and we pray that all who are a part of this are blessed and lifted up as they go out into the world to serve Jesus this week. And we ask it in his name. Amen. <laughs>
got two people helping I need a lot of help <laughs> uh, the scripture today is from 2nd Corinthians the 5th chapter reading the 6th through the 10th verses and it says this therefore being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from the Lord for we walk by faith not by sight we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be compensated for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or or whether bad. Amen. Thank you, Rodney. You may be seated.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody today. I want to welcome you to Northside uh, as we worship together. Those of you here in person, those of you online, we're glad that you are here with us as well. And we just look forward to uh, closing out this series on Come Together here uh, today. And so we come together to close out the Come Together series. <laughs> Steve Johnson called the monthly church council meeting of Westside Church to order at exactly 7 p.m. We've got a lot to cover tonight, folks, so we'd better get started, he said. As you know, our agenda is to agree on a unified church program for the, the new year. We're supposed to present it to the congregation in two weeks. And as chairman, Steve was qu feeling quite and understandably anxious over what was going to happen because few meetings... Few meetings would bring on such anxiety and divisiveness, perhaps, uh, about uh, church activities than this one. The only one that might surpass that is the annual church budget meeting. And so he was just, he was just full of anxiety and, and wanting to get through this and just praying to the Lord, you know, help us out. And so he asked a question very boldly in the meeting, who wants to go first? Well, this ought to be easy, said Ben Faithful, a deacon who'd been a member for 26 years. Last year was a good year. Let's just repeat all the good things we did last year. Well, I'd have to disagree with that, said Bob Newman. Times have changed, and I think we need to reevaluate everything we're doing. Just because a program worked last year and in the past doesn't automatically mean it's going to continue working next year. I'm especially interested in seeing us add a new worship service. You know, we all know, have seen how great it's been for Calvary Church down the road when they added their new service. And you get the picture. And over a, a few more hours, a couple more hours, a li worthy list of programs and causes was presented for, for inclusion in the church calendar. Karen Dewar passionately insisted that Westside Church take a more active role in Operation Rescue. John Manley gave a moving testimony about the men's retreat at camp and how it had changed his life. And he suggested a full slate of men's activities. Linda Loving spoke of the need to develop various support groups. Bob Lerner made his usual pitch for the church to begin a Christian school. And of course, Jerry Pinchpenny kept asking, how much will it cost as each proposal was presented? And all of them were valid suggestions. But the problem was, there seemed to be no standard of reference by which the council could come together and evaluate and decide which programs were being adopted. You see, everybody was vouching for the issue of their own passion. And critically missing from the equation was the passion that brought them all together and submission to that. Finally, Clark Reasoner spoke up. And Clark was the voice that everyone was waiting for at this point because whenever issues become confused at a church business meeting, he was the one who'd usually stand up and make a short speech and the majority of people would vote his way. And it wasn't that his ideas were better. In fact, most people often disagreed with him. But the sheer force of his personality made whatever he said seem sensible at the time. And people would just go with it. And you can just see here how the, the objectives are kind of circulating around the people and not something greater. And Rick Warren asked us to consider that question when he shares this story. He said, what's the problem in this scenario? There are multiple driving factors in this church that are competing for attention. And the, result, and the result of that is conflict in the church and a church that's trying to head in several different directions at the same time. Each, and he says each church, each church is driven by something. There's some sort of guiding force, a controlling assumption, a directing conviction behind everything that happens in the church. And now it may be unspoken. It may be unknown to many people. Most likely it's never been said or even officially voted on, but it's there and it's influencing every aspect of the church's life. And so he asked us to consider this question today. It's a good question. What is the driving force behind your church? What is the driving force? You see, churches and people, we're easily driven by a lot of things. Maybe it's traditions, or maybe it's personalities, finances, programs, buildings, even, and events. But in the end, only one thing truly matters. Only one thing. Or maybe one someone in my hand today, I have a baseball. Now, if I, I'm not going to throw it, don't worry. <laughs> my son saw me you know, looking for that, and he, you know, or I miss with my daughter or my son. One of my kids was asking me if I was going to throw this today, and I was like, no, I, that, would, that would not end well <laughs> for anybody. 
But I had this, this baseball in my hand, and you know, if I wanted to go to Dick's Sporting Goods today, I could go there and I could buy a high school or college regulation baseball for about $10, something just like this. If I wanted to get really, you know, kind of, you know, uppity, I could, I could go online and I could buy an official Major League Baseball, Rawlings branded baseball for $30 if I wanted to get really official with things. But if I wanted to go and fetch Babe Ruth's signed 1933 All-Star Game home run baseball, I'd have to have on hand at least $805,000 <laughs> in order to purchase that baseball. Here's another Babe Ruth-related story. Maybe some of you saw this this week. But before I get into this, according to legend, you've got to know the legend to understand what just happened this week with one of his jerseys. According to legend, in the 1932 World Series, so a year before Babe Ruth was in that 1933 All-Star Game, in the 1932 World Series, they're playing the Chicago Cubs, and Babe Ruth comes up to bat at the fifth inning. And as he comes back up to bat, he points to the outfield fence, and proceeds to hit a home run pretty much exactly to where he had been pointing. And so, and that's part of the Babe Ruth legend, right? If you're any kid who's ever pretended to be Babe Ruth at any moment, the way that you show everybody you're trying to be Babe Ruth is you walk up to the plate and you point to the fence and you make that claim, it's going to the fence, right? Well, just this week, the jersey that it said he was wearing during that game, which I, you see here on the screen, just sold that auction for $24 million dollars. $24 million for the jersey that it said that he wore in that game, in that moment. And there's even debate about whether he actually did that, but still, it, that's part of the story. It wasn't just that Babe Ruth had worn the jersey, it's about the story that goes with it. You know, if Babe Ruth had never worn that jersey, he probably would still fetch a lot of money, uh, you know, and it would be a great keepsake. Any Babe Ruth worn jersey is going to fetch some money. But it's the story also. It's who wore it and the story that goes along with it that made it sell for $24 million. $24 million. It's not just the person, but it's the story of what they did as well. And if I can bring this to us now for a moment, I could just, that baseball, I could just hold on to that probably the whole, <laughs> through this. But if I can bring this story to us for a moment. In recent generations, we've moved the story. Now, I'm not talking about Babe Ruth anymore. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about the story of creation. I recently heard a counselor and pastor, Chuck DeGroat, say this, and I think he's kind of on the money here. We're no longer in a story that's bigger than us, but the story is us, and I think that's a problem. We have lost the sense that we are a part of a bigger story. We've lost the sense of the transcendent. We're losing the concept that, that the story is about God and not us. We make the story about us and about everything we do. And there's a tendency, especially in our culture, for that and even in our churches. We're a part of a bigger story. And that's really, really important for us to hold on to today. What is this moment for us today? Can I ask that question? This moment we gather here together every week for an hour, right? We get together. And, and we set aside our time, and, and some of you here, you know, you know, I know you got buddies that are probably teeing off on the golf course this morning, or you've got other things that you could have been doing, but we set aside this time every week. Why? What is this moment for, this moment right here? Why does it matter when we gather in this space? Earlier this week, I was dropping my daughter off at school, and as we were driving to school, uh, we had some, you know, a Christian radio station on in the truck, and it was sort of playing in the background as we're going along, and we're talking and things, but we get to the school, and she gets out of the car, and it's just me and the radio at that moment, and I'm listening to the songs and things that are on the radio. Now, of course, and going into this moment to understand where my mind is, at this point, I'm already sort of like gearing up for this sermon where I know this Sunday I'm preaching about worship and how, how you know, worship and glorifying God brings us all together. So I've been reading a lot of theology books about worship. And if I can just say one thing about worship here, uh, it's really important. Worship, and I know Wayne would totally, he'd be the first person to say this, to come up here and say this. Worship is about more than music. Worship, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Romans 12, 1 says that worship is about the, the way we orient our life toward God and with God. 
We are to live as living sacrifices and singing songs of praise as we did earlier. And I'm appreciative of our worship team as we did earlier. Like that's one of the ways in which we worship God. But we worship God in all the things we do, hopefully in the way that we live. Or at least that's what we should aspire to. Worship is, is, is a very broad concept. But in this particular moment, I'm sitting in there listening to radio, the radio, and I'm listening to this song that I'm sure is being used somewhere, you know, as a, as a means for some to try and worship God and things. And as I listened to the lyrics and I tried to take them in, the, something really stuck out to me. And it was the words of, that I had read before, C. Welton Gaddy, who said this, Worship is for God only. The chief aim of worship is to please God, whether by adoration and praise, prayer and proclamation, confessions and offerings, thanksgivings and commitment, or by all of these actions combined. The point of worship is to recognize that God alone matters. God alone matters. And as I sat in my truck listening to what is surely a well-known song on Christian radio, I was troubled by this thought. Who is this song really about? Is it about God or is, the, is it really about the songwriter? Whose story is higher in these lyrics? Is it really all about the, what's happening in the person's life or is it a bit about the who? The who that caused those things to happen? The who that brought them about? Whose story is higher? And the same question I think I should pose to us and I pose it to myself as well today. Whose story is higher for us right now in this moment? As we walked into this space today, for which story do we believe we've gathered here today? Maybe we can answer that with answering this question. Did we come this morning with our heart prepared to offer ourselves and our lives as a living sacrifice? Or did we come this morning primarily to receive a blessing, first and foremost? The Romans 12, one passage that I mentioned before, this is what it says literally here. I appeal to you, brothers, Paul writes, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And I have to admit that there are a lot, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, actually, this, this Sunday itself, a moment ago before the service, I'm sitting back there, I'm preparing, going over my thoughts today, and it kind of occurred to me as I'm praying and things, God said, you know, here you are, you're getting ready to talk about the spirit with which we need to enter into worship. You're not in the right spirit today. Here you walked in, Nick. You walked in looking at this, and, and honestly, you're kind of more intent about what's going to happen and how it's going to impact you than you are about what you're giving to me in this moment. And I will admit to you, there are many Sundays, if not maybe even most Sundays, that I walk into this space looking for the blessing that I will receive instead of what I have to offer and who I'm offering it to. And in so doing, what I do is I make my story the driving force and not God's. So whose story is the reason we're gathered here today? Whose story? Is it the story of our life or is it the story of God? I want you to turn with me this morning to Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 is where we're going to be today. And uh, in this passage, just a little bit of a brief background to the book of Revelation. Revelation is a, a book, it's written, most believe, most scholars believe, by the Apostle John. Uh, he's writing it near the end of his life as he's exiled on the island of Patmos. We'll get to some reasons why that may be the case when we, when we get in a little bit later here. But he's a vision from God that he's been given, essentially, uh, he's writing to seven churches in particular, but it goes all around the, the, all the churches of that first century. They're all kind of taking it in because it's an encouragement to them all. But it's this vision for the future, the vision of, uh, that means something for them as they're reading it, but it also means something for us. And it's about, you know, what God's going to do and the second coming of Christ and, and how things are all going to come in the end. And here's what he writes in this particular section we're looking at today. Verse 9. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, as a symbol of of a victory, a victory celebration, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to who? To our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to whom? 
to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders, John says, he, he addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And he said to him, and I said to him, John says, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's a good picture. One that often, I think, encourages us. I hope it encourages us. Again, all the things I've said have given some background to this. This letter comes uh, to the people who receive it at a time of great need. You know, I mentioned about the circum some of the circumstances in which John is writing it, but there's also some cultural circumstances here, too, of what the church is dealing with when they receive this letter in the first century. You see, Domitian, at the time this letter is written, Domitian is the emperor of the, the Roman Empire. And a second great persecution against the church has broken out at that time. The first great persecution of the church happened under the reign of Nero. And a lot of people more commonly know that one because it is associated with the burning of Rome. Uh, Nero tries to burn a lower income, basically run down part of Rome to make way for new construction. In the process, the fire gets out of hand. He's got to blame somebody because he's not going to accept the blame for himself. And it ends up that the Christians are an easy target. And the Christians get the blame. And a great persecution, you know, rolls out against them. You know, and you've heard the stories of the human torches and things like that. Christians were set on fire. And different ways that w Christians were persecuted in those days against Nero. But with Domitian, in his time, the issue is that Domitian wants to be worshipped as a god. That's the primary issue and the reason persecution breaks out against the church. He wants to be worshipped as a god. And so, and this is the way, you know, as emperor, you, you make it a part of everybody's life so that they kind of are compelled to have to do it. And here's what happens. So if you were going to a civic event... Or maybe you were trying to, to, to process a legal transaction of some kind. Maybe you wanted to sell some property and you had to, you had to go through a process of, of uh, making that, through, going through a legal process of making that official. Well, part of that process now all of a sudden becomes, well, in the, as part of this, you have to pledge your allegiance to Domitian as Lord and God. By the way, the very same Greek words, kyrios and theos, that we use in New Testament to talk about Jesus Christ as Lord and God as God very same language that you had to you had to acknowledge you had to pledge allegiance to them in that also when you'd go to a sporting event or maybe you'd walk into a theater to see a play citizens were expected to toss they had there'd be these little this little altar or whatnot as you walked in and they had a pinch of incense and you were expected to throw a, a pinch of that incense on the altar as a way of basically offering a sacrifice to quote unquote the divine caesar now, in the culture as a whole, these practices weren't really seen as like major religious events, but if you're Jewish or you're Christian at the time, who were, the, were the, really the only two groups that were strictly monotheistic, as in they only worshipped one God, if you're one of those groups within this time and, and you're having, th this is unacceptable. This is idolatry. But if you refuse to participate in it, it all of a sudden calls into question your patriotism, and, and whether or not you're supportive of the emperor. And so you see, and we're going to get into this, the next series we're going to do after this one is on the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And, and in those chap uh, Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3, and you see there the churches are really struggling with this. And, and Jesus, through the pen of the apostle John, has some very strong words for those churches because they are very tempted in that moment to be compromising uh, and, and we understand it. We can at least sense maybe the reasons why there are these forces that are, are causing them to be tempted in that way. And so we have the book of Revelation entering in, the letter of Revelation entering into that time period when this is all going on in the church. And this vision is given to John by God, and it uses symbols and imagery to detail events that, that touched on things that were going on at the time, but were also about the future as well, and where things were headed. And to reassure the church that Jesus is coming back, and there is going to come an end where all sin is judged and all things are made right in creation. And it's easy to see. 
how such a letter could be really encouraging to a church that is sitting there and spent years being the punching bag, being ostracized, and feeling as though they have no country of their own and no place to belong. The passage we just read today, think about how that, hit, that passage would hit if you were that first century audience today. That passage we just read today, that picture of great unified worship, it's a picture of that moment of final victory in heaven. The moment that we all get home and we're before the throne. And it's all been made real. And there's this time of worship where the church is one in a, in a way that we've never been one before. The languages and the nations and everything are represented there. But we're all worshiping with one voice. We're in the presence of our God. Finally, we've never seen anything like that. We've seen a lot of great stuff on Sunday mornings. But we've never seen a Sunday morning worship service like that one. Imagine how encouraging that was. And maybe it even is to us today. And the first item that grabs our attention as we hear this passage is probably we look at this and, and it gra what grabs our attention is that amazing unity. That you have this great multitude that, that it says no one can count. It fulfills that promise long ago to Abraham, right? Your, your, your descendants will be as the sand on the seashore. The nations will be blessed through you. And we see all these nations coming together from every nation, people, tribe, and language. To fully appreciate the picture of this unity that's happening in heaven, though, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. So here we are, Revelation chapter 7. I want you to go back with me, though, just for a moment, all the way to Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. If we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, we see that there's a sort of unity still in the world. The world's a little bit different than what we know today, where we're all broken off into countries and we have different languages. In, a Revel or in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1, it says there that the whole earth had one language and the same words. So there's a type of unity happening, right? There's a type of unity, but what we see is it lacks one very critical thing. One very critical thing that is absent in Genesis 11 that we see present very much in Revelation chapter 7. And here's what it says, verse 4. It says, then they said, in this passage of Genesis here, the people came together in the same language and they said, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for whom? For ourselves. Let's make a name for ourselves. Let's do this for us. So we can just say, hey... We did it. Congratulations, us. And then it says, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, there's actually there's a lot in that last phrase there. We see what they're doing it for. We see their motivation. But also notice this. There's fear present in these people at that moment. There's a fear that's present because they have no center to pull them together and to keep them there. They're together in one language, but that's not enough. And they know it's not enough. Down deep in their soul, they know it's not enough. So they have this project. We're going to put this project together. We're going to build a city. That will keep us together for as long as we're building the city. But then, you know, they don't think about, you know, well, then what? God thinks about, well, well, then what? <laughs> You see, ever since the time that the Garden of Eden, the door has been shut to the Garden of Eden, God has been sitting on the fringe, and man has been estranged from him, mostly. And you see, without him, there's a great insecurity that erupts in our lives that makes us hungry for power so that we can provide for ourselves a security that we would otherwise have had in God, but we don't have any longer. So we try to grasp for power and to try to give ourselves that same security. The truth is, though, the more we try to grab for power in our pride, the more it destroys us. Sure, they can build the city and they can build the tower, but God knows that without him, their achievement will destroy them. And so he said, you know, Proverbs 18, 12, right? Haughtiness goes before destruction. Humility precedes honor. There's a shallowness to the unity of Genesis 11, Versus the unity we see in Revelation chapter 7. And that's the reason why, honestly, so often the quote-unquote unity that the world portrays at something like the Olympics always seems so hollow and empty to me and to you and to so many others. Because frankly, it's sort of a false unity full of a lot of pretense and God is not at the center of it. The only thing that is lasting and complete and full and makes for full unity in this entire universe is God. And without him at the center what we're hitching our wagon to won't last, but God does. David J. Atkinson writes this, and he's British, so some of the words are a little bit spelled a little different here, but he says, if you will live without God as the center, you will have no center at all. 
for a society which breaks the bounds of God-given order and which tries by itself to reach the heavens, the result for that society, the results are only disintegration and frustration. We have a lot of people and groups today trying to build unity around their own towers of Babel. And that's what this story is. If you didn't know already, this is the story of the people that built the tower or attempted to build the Tower of Babel. And we see what God does in his mercy, by the way, in verses 8 and 9. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. And the reason it's called Babel is because that sounds like the Hebrew word for confusion, or to be confused. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. And so God in steps, or steps in, and he divides them, he disperses them, and he gives them each a different language in order to, and we think, well, why did he do that? To save them from their pride. He always wants to, he's trying to save us from our pride because he knows pride goes before destruction. It's not good for us, it's not healthy for us. If we go on and we try to do something and we achieve something without God, all of a sudden we are less inclined to lean on God and to go to God and to find God and find our way to heaven and hope. And as the scripture unfolds, though, here's what we see in God's plan. God's plan begins to unfold. And as God, God's plan is unfolding through time, we actually see God redeeming this issue, but redeeming it in a way that matters and it's solid and it's, and it's grounded and it's, and it's got weight to it and gravity. It's substance. In Acts chapter 2, there's a, these language differences that God enacted many generations before are temporarily reversed on the day of Pentecost, for the Holy Spirit to be able to allow the apostles to proclaim the gospel to all the world in each their own language. God begins to redeem the situation with his plan. And then we see, and we see the gospel going out. And then we see now in our Revelation passage how those languages then are made in, in some way inexplicably perfectly harmonious in the great song of all who believe in Jesus that we will be singing on the great day of heavenly gathering, a song with God at the center of it. Salvation belongs again to who? To our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And so here's first point I want to make here. I'm kind of, the points are coming at the end of the point, if you know what I mean. If you will live without God as the sinner, you will have no sinner at all. Quite simple. So the heavenly worship commences in Revelation 7, and it describes that all these believers are wearing white robes. Well, what do those white robes mean? Verse 14 tells us the answer to that. It says that these, these are the ones who are coming out of the great tribulation, that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, there are many views of what the tribulation is in terms of uh, revelation. It's my belief that the tribulation describes our present age, which would be known as the church age, the age that we've been in since the day of Pentecost. And if that's true, church, how are we holding up the gospel and how are we holding on to it in the midst of this age? How are we doing? <laughs> maybe we don't feel like we're doing that well. Maybe we feel like maybe we're doing better than we were before. But however it is, this passage here gives us hope that if we will remain faithful, the present time of struggle will be nothing in comparison to the eternity that God provides. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says this, For this light and momentary affliction, Paul writes, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And who or what makes that hope possible? Who takes our tattered sinfulness and replaces it with purity? It's Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed for you and me on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of whose grace? His grace, which he lavished on, upon us in all wisdom and insight. I want you to imagine something with me today. Imagine that I was the one who uh, uh, that purchased that Babe Ruth jersey. I know it's going to take a big imagination, but, <laughs> but imagine that I was the one who purchased that Babe Ruth jersey for $24 million this past week. But I purchase it, and I give it to you to wear. And I give it to you with instructions specifically to not, you know, don't put, you can't put it in a vault, don't put it in a vault, don't create a fancy display, you know, in your house for it. I'm telling you, it's a jersey, put it on, wear it. $24 million jersey. 
you have my permission to wear it, and along with that, an authenticated, authoritative promise that it will never lose its value, and it will never receive a blemish as you do wear it. You didn't pay for it. All the sacrifice, all the money came from my pocket, not yours. How would you feel every time you put that jersey on? And how in the world would you ever forget me? Only by forgetting the gift itself. Like if we, if we hid it, we put it in a closet, we became ashamed of it in some way, we shove it to the back, maybe we don't look at it. Maybe you just neglect, all of a sudden, you know what, I just don't want to start, all of a sudden, like, I don't really want to spend time around Nick, because every time it kind of just reminds me, you know, I, I, in my pride, I kind of want to think that I did this for myself, so, you know, that kind of thing. The white robes that are in this passage, they are meant to symbolize our purity in Christ when we get to heaven. Now, whether that's our actual apparel, I, I don't know. But the idea is important, that it symbolizes the purity we have in Christ. And I do know this. There will be no mistaking in our hearts as to why we are there and who got us there when we are living in the presence of Christ, wearing a purity for eternity that we know was never ours to begin with. There will be no mistaking living in that light and in that moment and in that reality. The glorious gift of, heaven, or of Jesus is our only hope of heaven. The glorious gift of Jesus is our only hope of heaven. So in our verse, all the angels who represent the created beings of heaven, the elders who are seated around, rep who represent the church and the faithful of God through all time, and the four living creatures who represent all of creation, essentially the entire created universe is around, gathered around the throne in this moment, and the throne of who? Is it the throne of you? Is it the throne of me? No, it's the throne of God, and they all fall on their faces before him. Have we ever fallen on our face before God in prayer? Literally. Have we ever been in prayer and fallen under the conviction that I need to go to my knees or maybe even lay prostrate, prostrate on the floor, prostrate on the floor before God? When, when Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he's blinded by Jesus' glory and he falls to the ground. When Isaiah sees God in a vision of Isaiah chapter 6, he is terrified by the glory that he sees, saying in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in a people, in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In our Revelation passage today, it talks about the nature of our living in heaven, and it says of us in verse 15, this is the New American Standard Bible's version, for this reason, they are before the throne of God, they being us, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. The tabernacle of the Old Testament was the place of worship for the Hebrew people as they were wandering in the wilderness. And it was such because it was also the place where the presence of God was. In Exodus chapter 40, after the tabernacle is erected, verses 34 and 35 tell us that the glory of God fills the tabernacle such that Moses could not even enter it. And it was the same glorious presence of God that was leading them in a cloud by day and a pillar of the fire by night. And it sat there enthroned over the cherubim all the time that the ark was in the, in the Holy of Holies. As it sat on the, on the cherubim that adorned the cover of the ark of the covenant, the, God, the presence of God was there situated deep in the tabernacle in that space. Yes, God is to be feared terribly, but then when you realize, you realize that because of Christ, you're no longer seen as a hostile to his kingdom, but you're seen as one of his children, you become grateful for that awesome power and that awesome glory because it now serves to guide you and protect you and guarantee your eternal life. The fear of the Lord, I, I always said this and, I, and I, I love this thought, the fear of the Lord is the one fear that leads to the cessation of all others. <laughs> the fear of the Lord is great, and the glory of God is our only peace. The glory of God, the fact that he is glorious, the fact that he is almighty, that he is all these things, that is our only peace. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So it's easy to see in this brief picture of heavenly worship that we get in Revelation that without God at the center of our story, as a believer and even more so as a congregation, nothing else matters and nothing else really makes sense. So, above all things, live for the glory of God. If there's one thing, church, that we got to get around and we can get around, I think many of us maybe all are around. If we can get around this, let's get around this. Above all things, let us live for the glory of God. 
together. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 25, and 26. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Not just what, but who we build our lives and our churches around is much more important than what we do. We can do all sorts of charitable things, and we can even get awards for doing those charitable things. And our church was awarded. I don't know if you saw Nick's notes, but we got an award for an impact award here this last week for some of the things that we've been doing in our community and things, and that's great. But ultimately, all those things never really matter unless we have Jesus and we have God at the center of what we are and what we do and the why, why we're doing it. Jesus is the priority of those ministries and activities. If not, it's a chasing after wind. When we gather together to worship each week, it's not always perfect, but it is a chance to get a glimpse of heaven by proclaiming the great glory of God as one body. Paul Eshelman was the man responsible for distributing millions of copies of the Jesus film around the world. That was a movement that happened many years ago. The Jesus film told the story of Jesus. It was evangelistic and everything. And he was responsible for distributing it all around the world, all the different cultures and things. And he tells about a time when the film was shown at a refugee camp in Mozambique on the southeast coast of Africa. Although most of the people had never heard the gospel, they fell in love with Jesus through the film. When he was arrested, beaten, and led away to be crucified, they began to weep and wail, and many of them rushed toward the screen even. Their cries and the dust that they stirred made it impossible to finish the film, so the projector was turned off. And for more than 30 minutes, the townspeople were on their knees, weeping and confessing their sins. Each of the film crew members and counselors relayed to Paul Eshelman how much they would try to approach one of the villagers to pray with them. But the moment they would attempt to do so, the Spirit of God was so real to them even that the counselors themselves were falling to their knees, confessing their own sins and glorifying God. And they said this, they said the sense of God's presence, his power, his holiness was so great, they told Eshelman that no one could do anything but confess sins. When you experience the presence of God, you cannot help but realize your own sinful state. So eventually, as the story goes on, after more than 30 minutes, the Jesus film crew turned the movie back on so that people could know the rest of the story. And you know how the story ends. It does not end in death on a cross, but in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when the townspeople saw how the story had ended, Eshelman said this, the crowd exploded as if a dam had burst. Everyone began cheering and dancing and hugging one another and jumping up and down. And when the invitation was given for people to accept Christ, nearly everyone in the crowd wanted to respond. It makes you wonder when you hear a picture like that, how often we ourselves are letting ourselves be confronted by the glory of God. Or are we too busy dwelling in the lesser glory of another story? Whose story are we dwelling in today? Whose story is the higher story in our life today? My hope is above all things that it is the story of God and what he is doing in this world and that we see ourselves today in light of that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's a privilege to be able to gather here together as the body of Christ in your presence. And simply, Lord, I hope with our hearts, and, and I know it's a struggle, Lord. I mean, as we all walk in here, we all walk in here with this same spirit and flesh battle going on. And every Sunday, Lord, I know every day, Jesus said, you know, every day you pick up your cross and follow me. And, and, and there are just some days we do that better than others, and you know that, Lord. And so uh, help us in our inability, in our, in our uh, Lord, in our imperfection, in our uh, just... Uh, in our halfwayness, Lord, help us. But Lord, I pray that it is our desire, maybe not always perfectly followed out, but Lord, that it is our desire to come, whenever we come into this space or whenever we, even we come together in other places, in other venues, in other moments and ministries and, and things through the week, when we come together as believers, Lord, I hope we want, our prayer is that we, we make you and your glory the, the object of everything we do. 
Father, because you are glorious and you are powerful and you are almighty and you are things, Lord, we could spend a day just simply extolling how awesome you are. We love you, Father. You are worth it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, if the glory of God in some way has impacted you and you want to respond to that in some way, we want to encourage you to come forward in our time of decision. Let's go ahead and stand together and go before the Lord and worship today. Let's stand.
a seat. Mark, you can come on off here. This is Mark Purdom, and uh, he's been worshiping with us for some time, but in the recent weeks and things, he's been dealing with some back issues that have put him on restrictions at work, and then in the last couple of weeks, just as you've, if you've ever had to go through something like that, you probably know the spiritual battles that go along with that kind of limitation and not being able to do all the things you normally want to do, and that has been a spiritual battle for him. And so today, we just want to, he just comes forward just wanting to ask for prayer, and so we want to pray for him and encourage him with that. So let's go together to the Lord again in prayer and ask for his blessing uh, on, uh, on Mark here today. Father, we come before you today. We want to lift up our brother Mark to you. Lord, I know many of us in this place, we know, uh, you know, sometimes when you, when you go through those physical, uh, those physical restrictions, physical issues that limit your ability to do things, Lord, it's not just a physical battle so often as it is a spiritual battle. And so, Lord, we pray for one. I'm just so glad this guy is here today. I'm glad he's here with us in worship. And, uh, and Lord, I, I also I just pray that you be with him. We pray, Lord, that you will encourage him and strengthen him and uh, just help him to, to know, for one, he's not alone in all of this, uh, but that, Lord, certainly because you are with him most of all, that you are with him. Uh, Lord, he has you as, his, as his, his agent in all of this, as his uh, intercessor, uh, Father, uh, your son is his intercessor, and just going before him and going before your throne and lifting up prayers on his behalf and, and the Spirit as well, Lord. And so, thank, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are with us in these things, and we pray your blessing upon him and your healing upon his body today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. morning. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 12 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at the price, let's see, uh, lost my place, the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This verse very well explains how much we belong to God. It says that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It becomes the Holy Spirit's temple through baptism and the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Even after we get baptized, though, we still have to repent. God will forgive us if we truly mean it, but if we say sorry, then do it again. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. We have to want to repent and mean it sincerely. In John 10, 9, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He wants us to accept him as our Lord and Savior. It's clearly stated how much he wants us in John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God sent him here for a reason. So let us repent, and as we take this cup and this bread, remember, for what, remember what he did for us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the gift of your love, for wanting us so much that you would send Jesus here to die, your son, so that we can be with you in heaven. God, I hope that when we leave here today, that we continue to glorify you and spread your love with everybody. We love you and praise you. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Evan, for that meditation today, man. I really appreciate it. As we close the service here today, just a few things, actually a number of things we have going on, and uh, we're going to try to run through them here just uh, briefly for you. Just a reminder, of course, the way we can give, and encourage everyone to give as the Lord lays it on your heart to give. You'll see the ways in which we can do that. There are offering boxes at the rear of the room, as well as the online giving and the P.O. box that are listed there. Our fall groups are starting soon. The Parables of Jesus group is actually full for the fall now, Wayne's group. Uh, but there is still space for the parenting study that I'm going to be leading, Effective Parenting in a Defective World. And if you'd like more information about that, you can uh, check out Nick's notes. Actually, if you'd like to sign up for it, just email me at nick, N-I-C, at nschristianchurch.org. And let me know you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, we've got about uh, spots for about six, six more folks we can, we can take in that, that group. So I'd love for have, to have you in that if that's something that would interest you. Also, Project 412 Exothermic, our Wednesday pro program for the middle schoolers and high schoolers, begins this Wednesday at 530 uh, for the middle school and high school students, and so I encourage you uh, uh, to make sure your kids are part of that and uh, young people to be a part of that. Uh, great opportunity there. Next Sunday evening, Awana and Switch begin. Awana is for uh, our preschool through elementary ages, uh, as well as we have our Switch program, which again is middle school and high school. That's all going on from 5 to 6.30 next Sunday evening, and the studies that I just mentioned for adults, those parallel uh, that time frame. And so that's next Sunday night that all the Sunday evening stuff kicks off again. September 21st, we are planning an Ark Encounter trip to the Ark Encounter up in Grant County. Every family is responsible for getting your own tickets, but we'll meet here at Northside and travel together up there to the Ark. You can sign up at the information desk if you plan to attend. Uh, we will provide snacks for that, that event, so you can uh, be assured we will provide sustenance for you and your family on that particular aspect of things. Uh, on the first day of each month, as you know, this year we have been praying and fasting over a variety of topics. Uh, you're going to love me for this because if you didn't know this, it's like right before lunchtime and I'm about to tell you that today <laughs> is the day. <laughs> today we're inviting you to take time uh, as you do or however you do, uh, take a time to fast and pray today. We encourage you to take time to pray for all those that teach within our church. Uh, that they would uh, faithfully expound the Word of God and make it applicable to our lives and help us to understand it and know it. With that, if you're physically able to help us, we need all, actually, is it just chairs on all the chairs, right? Is it just that side? Oh, it's just this side. All the chairs on this side. <laughs> we need all these uh, on the baptistry side picked up, if you can help us with that after the service. With that, I think that's everything. So let's stand together for a closing word of prayer. Wayne will close us, and uh, then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you in humble adoration of who you are and the things you have done and the things that you continue to do for each and every one of us. The love that you continue to pour out on us is undeserved, and yet we thank you for your graciousness, your forgiveness. Father, may we come. And may our lives be presented to you as an act of worship. May everything we do, whatever it is, we do it for the glory of God. We love you and we praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.